Hey, what's up guys? It's Michael from The Honest Youth Pastor back again with the third video in our series on uh, critical race theory, social justice, the church, how that all interacts. If you missed the first two book uh, overviews, you can check those out in the links in the description below. Um, to give you kind of an overview of what's going on, I read two books on the side that would very much lean to or hold to uh, critical social justice or critical race theory. And then there's two books on the uh, what I would consider the other side that are opposed to uh, critical social justice and critical race theory in regards to how it interacts with Christianity and the church. Uh, today, the book overview we're going to be looking at is Fault Lines. Uh, and I did with Fault Lines like I've done with the other two books, like I'm going to do with the last book that we do. I listened to the audiobook three times through because of my commute, because of the time I have accessible to do this. I cannot physically sit down and read all of these books, but I've listened to them three times through. The first time, all the way through, no notes, just taking in what it was saying. The second time, taking notes of kind of like the highlighted parts. And then the third time, taking detailed notes that then become these presentations. Uh, my goal is here to uh, summarize as, as accurately as possible the big ideas that are presented in these books so that we all have sort of a working knowledge of, of these books that then will be translated into the fifth video in which we kind of combine all these together and say, okay, well, how... How uh, is critical race theory presented and uh, can the church interact with that and what does it look like? So um, the purpose of reading this book specifically is twofold, just like the other ones, to have a basic understanding of what the book says and what it covers and be able to uh, have, uh, have an informed conversation with other people that have also read this book. Um, because with all of the books we're looking at, there's this assumption on all of them that you can just look at the cover and you know exactly what they're talking about. And that's just simply not true. Um, as I said before, this is part of a wider video. Again, links in the description. Uh, depending on when you're watching this, they're already there or they're to be announced. So, uh, Vody Bauckham wrote this book, and Bauckham starts uh, the first chapter is kind of the introduction. It's actually even before the introduction. It's called The Thought Line, in which he outlines um, the definitions of critical race theory and where, more importantly, where critical race theory came from. Um, so he goes through, here's all of that. Uh, before he gets into his main points of the book, he basically starts at 1989 and says there's four huge things that happened in 1989. Now, he doesn't cover all of these in the book, but he sets them forth as um, this sort of pivotal shift in society that was happening at the time that kind of set in motion everything he would say we see now with critical social justice and critical race theory. The first thing is Derek Bell held a conference in Wisconsin where he says, uh, where Bauckham says CTR was born. Basically, uh, my research, a little bit I did on this, uh, and by a little, I mean very little, but um, Bell held a conference to basically talk about what critical justice theory would look like or critical race theory would look like. Uh, at the same uh, year, at the same time, Kimberly Crenshaw, which was I guess sort of a protege of Derrick Bell uh, was introducing the ideas of intersectionality and we'll kind of get into that a little bit more in this book he, he talks about that and then there was a lady named Peggy McIntosh which published her book called White Privilege um, he talks a little bit about this and we'll look at it and uh, as we go through the book here but basically it seems like sort of a forerunner it has a lot of the same ideas as um, white fragility um, from what I can tell, I haven't read that book, but from what I, from the information Bauckham provides, it sort of seems like that. He also says that Marshall Kirk and Hunter Madison wrote a book called After the Ball. Uh, it's a longer title, but it wouldn't fit on the slide. But basically, uh, it's, it's how um, homosexuality was going to be slowly accepted to where it would be uh, accepted by the culture because in 1989 it wasn't totally yet. So that was kind of the, the idea of the book. Um, Bauckham does have two lectures in which he kind of talks about this book. Uh, I'll put those in the link in the description below. Uh, Bauckham says that um, all of these four things are per, uh, a product of what he says is critical social justice. Uh, he does reference critical race theory a few times in this book. Um, but overall, he sees critical social justice as sort of the umbrella over all of these separate issues. So whether it be homosexuality, whether it be white privilege, whether it be intersectionality, whether it be critical race theory, all of these things are under the umbrella. And a few more things would probably be under this umbrella as well for him, but that he names all of these things are the umbrella of critical social justice. Um, throughout Thoughtline, he says to understand critical social justice, we must understand where it, com where it comes from and what it does. Um, he ties all of this back 
uh, to Karl Marx, Antonio Gramsci, the Frankfurt School, uh, and all of this, all of these people um, address social issues and social change and what it would look like uh, to to view things through a certain worldview. Obviously, uh, Marx, Karl Marx, Marxism, all of that. Uh, Frankfurt School ties into that as well. And Bauckham ties all of the things in the last slide. And it says all of the things that were kind of shifting in 1989 have their ties in Marxism and the Frankfurt School and all of that. Um, so he does identify two terms for us, critical being identifying and exposing problems. Um, he, doesn't, he does state in the book that the critical part of critical theory doesn't actually fix any problems. It just identifies the problems. Uh, and then theory, which is the uh, thinking behind critical, I'm sorry, the thinking behind critical thinking at the academic level. He, he takes all of this and really says that, um, specifically talking about the Frankfurt School, he takes it all at an academic level and he says that that's where a lot of it's taught and then it kind of trickles down into uh, the wider society through colleges and um, things, seminaries uh, later on as well. Uh, critical theory denies objective truth uh, and says that objective truth isn't possible. So he wants to set this forth as we kind of go into, um, into the book and looking at critical social justice, specifically critical race theory, um, that it denies that you can be objective. That it, it comes with this idea that you are defaultly programmed a certain way um, and you can't see things objectively. Um, though that doesn't really play out very logically. But anyway, that's that's what he says. Uh, critical theory isn't simply a tool, he says, but a worldview. And this is where, um, again, he states this at the beginning of the book, which is good, but this is where the disagreement um, comes up with people on either side of the conversation. Some people would say that it is a tool in which to use to see different things in society, and then when you are able to see them, you can then fix them with the tool of critical social justice. Uh, Bauckham would say that critical social justice isn't a tool to fix things with, rather it is a set of uh, worldview, it's a set of lenses that you put on, and then that's how you view everything. Um, it's not just a, hey, I see this and now I can use this tool to fix it. It is a lens you put on to where everything you see is under the, uh, behind the lenses of critical social justice. Um, CTR, as I've already said, he stated is an outgrowth of critical social justice. It falls under that umbrella. And throughout the book, uh, he, he wants to make clear before he gets into the introduction and the chapters is that he doesn't want to build a straw man. He's, he's very deliberate about stating that is that he wants to use the definitions that critical race theorists use to define critical race theory and he doesn't want to ha say this is my definition of it he wants to have them state their own definitions so as to avoid a straw man um a straw man discussion which people can say oh that's just bacham's view it's not the real view so throughout the book um he quotes a lot of people now again with the audiobook it's very hard to tell um where those quotes are coming from in, unless he deliberately states it after the fact in the actual printed version. Um, I'm sure there's, there's references at the bottom. Um, but again, that's sort of the, that's the, 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 the bad thing about doing this audiobook wise. I can't give you footnotes, unfortunately. So um, he does say that a worldview is a, is an analytical lens in which one processes the world uh, according to, and he does bring this up before he gets in. He says that Richard Delegato, um, says that the worldview of CTR is based on four premises primarily, or presuppositions rather. Uh, the first is that racism is normal. The second is, um, second is that racism advances the interests of the white and working class, which he would, white and working class go together. Uh, third, that is uh, whites are unable to do righteous deeds. And four is that the knowledge uh, is socially, knowledge is socially constructed. Um, he does go into a little bit about uh, how whiteness is normalized, like whiteness is centric, it's center, it's what's considered normal, and that's built and constructed, obviously. All of these terms, um, we won't get into it a lot until the last video we do where we look at how all this comes together, but from what I can tell um, from reading the last two books, this these are accurate representations of critical race theory as far as, I mean, referencing the last two books. Uh, he does say that intersectionality is based in CTR. Intersectionality speaks of the layers of oppressions that minorities suffer. And this is where he, he doesn't touch on intersectionality a whole lot more. He does just periodically throughout the book, 
but he does set the definition up here and give us an example. For example, he says, in case you don't understand what intersectionality is, he says that intersectionality is the layers of oppression. So for example, a black person has one layer of oppression. A, a black woman has two layers of oppression because she's black and she's a woman. And a black lesbian woman has three layers of oppression because she's black, she's a lesbian, and she's a woman. So just so you kind of, I, I thought that was a really good, simple, short example of what intersectionality looked like as far as defining what layers of oppression look like. He then goes into the uh, introduction of the book. So now that he's set up all of the, uh, the definitions, kind of where he says it comes from, he sets sort of the baseline of, okay, this is, these are the things that we're working with. He moves in and saying that culture, uh, we are currently living on a fault line. Now we, when he means we are currently living on a fault line, he means Christianity. Um, it's, it's hard to tell throughout the book because Though he uses a lot, uh, almost all of his examples are within Christianity, um, it's important to note that this is not a book for people outside the church. This is specifically about a, a book for uh, those that, that are in the church that would consider themselves Christians. He says, currently we're living on a fault line. He brings up the fault line of social, it's a, I'm sorry, Bauckham brings up the fault line of social justice and how it's currently shaking. Uh, he does call out names here, which is, um, I don't know how I feel about this. We'll talk about it a little bit more later. I know this is just an overview, but he does bring up names to sort of set this idea of who's on what side based upon, um, maybe what they've said before or the statements they've made or the statements they refuse to made, make. Uh, for example, he says, uh, Tabidi and Mbimble. I know I always say his name wrong. Uh, but I think you know who I'm referencing, uh, Tim Keller, Russell Moore, the Nine Marks organization, as well as the SBC uh, have cited uh, or have made statements that would coincide with critical race theory. And he says he himself, uh, John MacArthur, Owen Strange, Doug Wilson, all those guys he said are on the side of uh, that are opposed to critical race theory. And he sets this up at the beginning. I think the reason he does this, and this is just an assumption, is that he's saying that within Christianity, there are, there are big names, um, that have followings as far as just, you know, this, I, you know, for example, I, I grew up listening to this guy and I really like his theology sort of situation. Uh, and he says they're on both sides of the issue. And the whole book is to, and he will state this later is to say, okay, here's the fault line. Which side are you on? Because eventually this is going to split. Um, we'll talk about this in a minute, but I'm getting ahead of myself. But he does say that eventually, like, there's no will that will this or will this not happen. He's very sure that there will be a split in the church, and these are the sides that people are currently on, while while everything's sort of shaking. But the split hasn't happened yet. Uh, he says that calling it a looming catastrophe. Uh, that's the the byline in the book. He kind of says calling it a looming catastrophe is not an over exaggeration. He says that growing ethnic tensions are not the problem that the churches face, uh, nor are political divisions um, the problem that the church face. Both of these obviously are tensions in the church, but these aren't the biggest ones. He says rather the problem is social justice versus biblical justice. And if you looked at all into this whole discussion, um, this is kind of what it comes down to all the time. Social justice versus biblical justice, though you could probably fit those first two categories into one of those two categories as well, or both. Uh, he claims that uh, this will eventually split evangelicalism right down the middle. Like he makes this point a couple times. According to Bauckham, this split is inevitable. There is nothing that can stop it. Um, he, uh, this isn't at the same level of the Reformation. He's he makes clear to say like this is a big deal, though it's not Reformation big deal. Uh, the goal of this book is not to avoid that trouble. He says that it's can't be avoidable. It's just frankly to show what critical race theory is and what happens if you embrace it and to warn people about it. That's those are the three big things of the book. Uh, he is ready, writing the book to identify both sides of the fault line and ask the reader to choose a side. Uh, he is aware that writing the book will cause many to say that he is unaware, uninformed, trying to have favor with uh, certain people. He actually, I think he says, yeah, particularly white people. Um, Bauckham says that if you knew about him, it would be clear that none of the above things were true. And then that's what he kind of sets up in the next couple chapters. Um, the one thing um, that is evident at the beginning, and we'll see it at the end of the book as well, is that he is he knows that it's going to cause some problems. And that's why I think 
he writes these next two chapters. Chapter one, he tells the story of his family and how they arrived where they did from California to Texas. Uh, by doing so, he recants how his parents met, their relationships, their jobs, his early childhood. Uh, he also tells the story, uh, his story as a young black man, as it pertains to uh, desegrega desegregation and busing. He goes into a lot of details in that regard. He also speaks of how he dealt with uh, the feelings of that and how he was not accepted. He does mention uh, how he experienced racism a number of times, uh, specifically one he points out. Um, he does consistently point to his mother, though, um, and her determination of teaching him uh, and providing him the opportunities and assisting him and continually pushing him as kind of the driving force that allowed him um, not to fall into sort of uh, gang activity, uh, things that would get him in trouble uh, with the police. Like all of these things, he points back that his mother actively um, pushed him to be the best version of himself. Uh, he states that his story shows that critical race theory isn't needed. Uh, that, for example, family and structure are what builds a person up into the productive uh, productive individualism, not social structures or white people being anti-racist. He, he sets forth in this first chapter that the reason he was able to get into adulthood uh, wasn't because, uh, well, one, wasn't prevented by systematic racism, but secondly, he says that he was able to do so not because uh, white people opened doors for him or gave him a, or platformed him or anything like that. Rather, it was because he had a, a family and a structure, even though it was just his mom, that uh, pushed him and helped him be the better version of himself. The one thing I will say here, and we'll see it in chapter two, is that um, he, he kind of goes against this point in regards to when he gets to college as far as people that you know platform him but we'll talk about that when we get there uh chapter two he starts off uh, chapter two by moving into more detail about being a black christian by this point uh he's going to college uh people uh, the, he tells a story about being uh, evangelized to uh, he states that most black christians have to wrestle with if they're black first or christian first and this is where chapter two he really goes into a lot of his worldview as far as how he sees um, Christianity relating to the individual person and their ethnicity and their and their history and their upbringing. He says that black Christians are often told that Christianity is a white man's religion to keep black people in subjugation to white people. Uh, Christianity, he says, isn't something that sets on top of our identity. Rather, it becomes our identity. He spends a great deal of time talking about that uh, in regards to his wrestle with becoming um, having his identity firmly in Christi in Christ uh, and not in his blackness. Um, he, he talks about that a little bit. He points out, uh, he points to the death of his cousin as, turning, as a turning point in his life. Uh, he was later ministered to by a fellow football player. Uh, he talks about you know, his scholarships, how he got into college. Uh, the fellow football player helped him uh, know how to read the Bible. He taught him how to read the Bible, how to exegete, how to um, look at context. And then he also shared the gospel with him. And, and this fellow football player doing that led Vody to asking questions about Christianity and really questioning that and really led him into the apologetic side of Christianity because he had to question whether this was real or not. Um, he then speaks about his life as a young Christian and being what he says is Afrocentric. Um, he, he deals a lot about this in chapter two. Again, it's this wrestle be, between being Afrocentric and being a Christian, like how do those two things go together? He spends almost all of chapter two in various ways talking about that. He brings up Afrocentrism because he wants to show that uh, he was at the time, uh, quote, more black than Christian. Uh, he walks through his early years looking, uh, he, he talks about how he brought prominent black clubs onto campus, uh, how when he was looking for a church because he had to go to a, ba a Southern Baptist church to get a scholarship, uh, he specifically looked for an all black church. Um, and he talks about like everything he was looking for was how can I get around people that look just like me? Uh, he also speaks of how he uh, accidentally double majored in sociology and Christian ministry. He says that proved to be very helpful later in his life. I think the reason he mentions this, not just for the fact that um, he has a degree in sociology, but because it, it, it lends credence to what he's going to talk to uh, talk about rather in the rest of the book. So in the other two books that we've read before this, or in most books at all, really, if, if someone's presenting an argument, they have to show their credentials for why they're even 
you know, why, why should we even listen to them present their argument? Are they qualified to do so? Um, voting takes a very un, uh, uh, uncommon path in doing this in this book. Most people would uh, talk about their degrees. Most people would talk about um, all of the uh, speaking engagements or awards or all the accolades they have. Vody kind of takes that in an opposite direction and talks about his childhood and then he talks about his adulthood as, as a black child and then a, a black Christian and he works it out that way while also working in that he has a sociology degree that he studied this a long time. It's a very interesting way to to to, to walk us to the point to where he says, I'm, act, I'm very qualified to talk about this. This is the whole reason he writes chapter one and two, apparently. It's what it seems like. Uh, he states that he is very much uh, for pro uh, social ag advocacy. In fact, he has served in a number of advocacy, advocacy situations, working in group homes with children that were uh, in terrible situations. He, he, he kind of connects them to kind of the situations he grew up with. The reason he makes this point, and apparently I failed to put, um, yeah, apparently I failed to put this in the slide, but he, he brings this up because he says oftentimes there's this dichotomy with one side of the argument saying, uh, you know, people say just preach the gospel, he says, but you know, the, the argument is that if you say just preach the gospel, you're trying to shut the conversation down. And he says, and then the other side says, you know, we have to seek advocacy all the time. God is for all the minorities. And he says in that, that these two groups are always at odds calling each other names. And he says that there's a way to do both. And he brings this up as a way that, you know, you can seek advocacy for the oppressed, but also you're doing so by preaching the gospel into the situation. Um, he said he pursues advocacy work because God used this work to deliver the oppressed. That's why he was in it. Um, Bacham states that he, uh, yeah, well, here it is. I didn't, <laughs> I did include it. It's just a later slide. Bacham states that he sees a false dichotomy that says that you are either on the side of the oppressed or you're trying to shut the conversation down, ignoring minority voices and internalizing white privilege. He moves on to speak uh, of his time at the SBC and his exit from it, stating that he had no harsh feelings and it was actually uh, very encouragement, uh, a bit of an encouragement for him to continue what he was doing. Um, this is where I said that the last statement that he said that, you know, it proves C his life proves that CTR isn't needed. He does make a note in chapter two, and I think it's noteworthy just for the honesty of this overview. Um, that when he went to Southern Baptist universities, I forget which one exactly he said he went to. Um, but when he was there, there were professors that put him under their wing and st said they saw potential in him and said that they, uh, they, they pictured him and they wanted to kind of groom's the wrong word, but like put him on a path to becoming a president of a Southern Baptist university. Now he doesn't say that that's at all connected with his ethnicity, but to say that there weren't people that platformed him is also incorrect because they did platform him. So it's just kind of who knows what their motives were really, right? So that's kind of where this, that's where that could go either way. Uh, he says that it was up until this point, he hadn't really considered racial reconciliation. He had gone through uh, his entire uh, childhood, his entire adult life in as far as college goes, um, not ever really hearing about racial reconciliation. Um, he refers back to earlier in the chapter when he spoke about seeking out specifically black churches and black clubs and being very ethnocentric. He said it wasn't until a promise keeper rally uh, that he even considered uh, reconciliation within the church. And he said when it did come up, it was all from white pastors. He said that there weren't any black pastors, uh, you know, uh, repenting over the fact that their churches were 99.9% .9 black. He said it was all white pastors um, lamenting the fact that they didn't have ethnically diverse congregations. Uh, he noticed that it was only white pastors. I already said that he concerned this concerned Bacham. And um, he silently, he said this was a turning point for him in which he purposefully set out to find staff positions at churches that were where he would be the minority. Uh, he wanted to pursue this rac racial reconciliation, but he didn't want to make a big hoo-ha about it, basically. Like, he just wanted to do it because uh, he found that there would be, he thought there would be merit in it. Now, in this chapter, this is near the end, he is very honest about the reality that he did experience racism uh, in these churches. He did experience pushback. Um, he, he, he talks about the cultural differences as far as song, as far as how the church service went, as far as the movies and the music these people listened to. He said it was all different. And he actually does talk about how 
uh, he was chastised by some black other black pastors, black pastors for um, for taking his talents and his abilities to serve the white man. Um, and that was something where he was kind of getting shot from both sides. Um, he ends the chapter by briefly describing how now living in Africa. Um, so I skipped ahead. Basically, uh, he visited Africa a number of different times. Uh, the first time to speak and he just loved it. And then over the process of, I think he said it was like five or six years and visiting a number of different times, him and his wife decided that, you know, they wanted to move their family there to pursue um, this, um, this school of training uh, those there up in the faith and to become pastors. So they had actually moved there. I think he says at the time of the writing of this book, they had been there five or six years. I can't remember which, but it was right around that time. Uh, the one thing too that I didn't note that I want to reference here while we have it, not only did he say it was difficult on him when he went into these predominantly white churches, as far as experience racism and pushback, he does make a careful note that it was really hard for his kids as well because they were always, not only were they the pastor's kids, so they had that that pressure in that bubble, but he says that they were always in the minority trying to you know figure out how to act, how to speak, what to do. And there was a lot of pressure on them as well. And I, I appreciate that he puts that in here and doesn't try to gloss over the fact that it happens and it happened. In fact, throughout this book, we'll see that he does mention that racism is a real thing, which I think is an important thing to note when you're reading this book, because um, if you don't read this book, it would be very easy for you to assume one thing, but he actually does state this in this book. Uh, chapter three, uh, he now moves on to the idea of seeking justice using uh, the last two chapters that he talked about, about his life and his growth uh, as his qualifications to be able to speak about seeking justice. In this chapter, uh, Bakum goes through the uh, through and critiques a number of different cases that have led to the uh, way, it led the way in pushing the idea of critical race theory in society. He st uh, starts by attempting to remind the reader that before we pass judgment, we should first seek justice by seeking the facts before buying into the stories that we hear before we hear the facts. He gives a number of different examples of media skews, how media skews or has skewed uh, stories to focus on the quote unarmed black man. Um, and thus selling a false narrative. He backs up his theory here with statistics and scripture of how we should use those statistics. Uh, it is impossible to summarize this chapter in slides. So the one thing I would say is I would encourage you with all of these books, I would encourage you to buy them and read them. Um, if nothing more, just for the information, regardless of what side of this argument you fall on. Um, chapter three, I cannot summarize. Uh, he goes through and covers probably the last six, seven years of uh, really high profile uh, shootings. Um, he covers George Floyd. He covers, I mean, all the way back uh, Tamir Rice. He goes all the way back and he goes through and covers all of the names of the people that really uh, were prominent in the forming of the Black Lives Matter movement um, that have um, really caught media headlines and cases and all of that. And he goes through and he statistically goes through while acknowledging the tragedy in those situations, goes through and gives facts and resources uh, to double check his facts um, to show that these these are not presented in an accurate manner. And that's about that's all I can say to summarize chapter three because it would be and this is where I really hated having the audiobook and not the the actual physical book um, because I think um, even just the numbers I jotted down it would be much more helpful to have that in front of you. Um, by way of just having that information and being able to double check it, right? You want to make sure he's accurate in what he's saying. So uh, that's all of chapter three is going through uh, all of the shootings, looking at the statistics, and then bringing and saying, okay, well, this is statistically uh, right or this is statistically wrong and working through those. He then uses that to move into chapter four. After he gives a detailed work through the cases over the past six years, Bakum now asserts that these cases were used to push forward the thought process and worldview of critical social justice. Uh, he ports forth the idea that critical social justice is actually its own type of religion and goes as far as to call it a cult. Uh, he states his goal for this chapter is fourfold. Uh, the first is to lay out a theological underpinning. Uh, of a theology and a world and the worldview of critical social justice. The second is to help the reader see that this view is uh, in contradiction to a biblical worldview. The third is to give examples uh, that show uh, the prevalence of the worldview within evangelicalism, so the church's acceptance of social uh, critical social justice. And four, the reader to understand 
uh, the, help the reader understand that understanding the elements of this worldview is helpful for having a God-honoring conversation about race. So um, he goes in, this is actually called A New Religion. That's the, the, the name of the chapter. Um, he defends his calling social critical justice, uh, critical social justice, rather, a cult. He says that critical social justice, or he also refers to it back and forth throughout the book as anti-racism. Uh, he calls it the anti-racism cult, can be identified in the same way that other cults can also be identified. For example, they stay close to scripture and look like they're Christian. Uh, it has new ter theology that, uh, that also comes from, so the same terms come from Christianity and they use those terms, but they use them in a different way. Uh, they borrow from familiar uh, and redefined definitions. That's what I just said. They have their own system of theologians, saints, catechisms, and objects of worship. Basically, he just goes through and says that um, some of the theologians of critical social justice would be, uh, he, he talks about Abraham X. Kendi. He talks about uh, Jamar Tisby, the, the author of the last book we looked at. Um, and he goes through and just states that, okay, these this is kind of in, a, in Christianity, you would have your theologians, you would have your saints that you looked up to, you would have your catechisms that you repeated, and you'd have your objects of worship. And critical social justice has all of those things, um, though they wouldn't classify themselves as a religion, Vody would, and he would not only classify them as a religion, he would classify them as a cult. Uh, he goes like one step further. So on that note, real quick, before we go any further, um, he, he he's... He's not pulling any punches up to this point in the book as far as his, his pushback against critical social justice. Um, I think I made a note of it, but if I didn't, I want to remember it and tell you now. He is very careful, though, as he points out people's names here, not the first chapter when we looked at it, but here on out, when he points out people's names, that he is careful to note that he doesn't have disdain against these people but he is very concerned about these people that put forth this uh, this view because he, obviously he thinks it's wrong. I think we know that this far in the chat in the book. But he, he wants to make sure that though he's pushing very hard back against it, he doesn't hate these people that are that are um, that are the proponents of it. He just thinks they're very misguided. So in case I did not include that later, he does say that, and I want to make sure that I, I mention that uh, as other. I'm sorry, as with other religions or cults, uh, critical social justice, he says, has a system of beliefs. Bakum uses a good part of this chapter to speak tongue in cheek about um, critical social justice and communicates their belief system like Christians communicate their belief systems. He states that critical social justice would say something along the lines of in the beginning, white people created whiteness. Whiteness is a set of uh, is a set of normative privileges granted to white skinned individuals and groups, which uh, is invisible to those that are privileged by it. Throughout this chapter, he quotes um, he quotes D'Angelo a couple times. He, he he quotes different people. I think this is the chapter where he's basically saying, "I'm going to let critical race theory speak for itself by quoting other people." Now the question would be, um, again, I wish I had the physical copy, but the idea is that is he citing those people? Uh, and the and the sources in in the footnotes because that would be incredibly important to make sure that these um, these quotes are in context. Uh, I say that just to say, along with all of the books that we're going to read, we want to make sure that these statistics and the quotes they're using are verifiable. Um, all that to say, and we'll discuss this a ton more in the last video. But as far as I can tell, in chapter four, from reading the last two books, he's using the definitions correctly. Uh, he says, just as Christians don't conceive of anything in their worldview not conceived by their God, the anti-racist roots every aspect of their worldview in the, assertion, in the assertion that everything begins with the creation of whiteness, more specifically, establishing white people as the oppressor and all others as the oppressed. He quotes Robin D'Angelo when he uses the term white and whiteness, saying that she says, the terms I am using are not theory-neutral desc descriptors. They are theory-laden constructs, inseparable from systems of injustice. Uh, these terms and theories carry a worldview, Bakum says. He says the second tenet of critical race theory or critical social justice is that on the second day, the white people created white privilege. White privilege is a series of, a series of unearned advantages given to white people because of their whiteness. He does reference uh, Macintosh's book, uh, white privilege uh, as as far as uh, referencing the knapsack of privilege, I think is how she defines it. There we go. Um, Bakum, I keep getting ahead of myself on, <laughs> on these points. 
Bauckham refers to pastors like Matt Chandler using languages from Macintosh's paper or her book when addressing race and privilege during sermons. Um, he, he talks about a clip that uh, Chandler put out on the internet as well as a sermon, a part of his sermon that he talked about. I believe I actually did a sermon review on the sermon he's talking about, though Matt could have uh, Matt Chandler could have said it more than once, but he does reference Chandler. Um, he says, on the third day, white people created white supremacy. They would say, he said on the third day. Uh, white supremacy doesn't mean that uh, what it used to mean. It now means any system that promotes, protects, and enhances white privilege. Uh, to put down the oppress, oppress, to put down and oppresses anything that isn't white. Uh, this does not refer to KK, the KKK or blatant racism. Rather, it is the dominance of white normality. Again, this white centrality um, that we've seen and talked about in the other books. He says that on the fourth day, white people created white complacency. White complacency maintains that all white people are racist by participating in systems that therefore oppress others that were set up to privilege the white people. Um, this is imputed guilt, he says. Uh, whereas Christians see Adam as the federal head of all humanity, in which guilt is imputed to all people, critical race theory sees the inventors of whiteness as the head of all white people, and the imputed sin then goes to all white people. Uh, without the confession of white racism, white supremacy, and white privilege, people that are white Christians will never be free. You have to repent of all these things, work and penance for them. Uh, he says that on the fifth day, critical race theory would say, white people created a white equilibrium. White equilibrium is a cocoon of racial comfort in which uh, we run, into which white people run when their whiteness is questioned. Um, white equilibrium allows white people to not have to deal with or understand racism or bigotry. Again, pointing back, this is the exact definition that D'Angelo uses. So I'm not sure if he's, uh, I, he's getting a lot of his information from D'Angelo, but he does uh, talk about Be the Bridge by Natasha Morrison. Didn't uh, that wasn't one of the books? Obviously, I looked through, but he does reference "Be the Bridge" a number of different times. Uh, he says that "Be the Bridge" gives us a good read on the influence of the idea of white equilibrium, and how, more specifically, that has infiltrated the evangelical church. Apparently, "Be the Bridge" is a pretty big book within some evangelical circles. Uh, Bacham states that her book, in her book, she points out things like reparations and Black Lives Matter movement as non-starters for many people in the church. She says that this is an example of white equilibrium at play because it shows that um, it shows them that addressing the issues will cost them something. Them in both cases there is, is white people. Uh, he states that often people will be accused of white equilibrium simply for asking questions about reparations or asking questions about Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter while they are simply trying to point out underlying issues or inconsistencies they see in it. So basically... Uh, he, he's saying that the reason it's a non-starter is because as soon as questions are asked to kind of push back about reparations or Black Lives Movement, the conversation shut down because now both, <laughs> both, both sides are at a standstill because one side won't go forward until you talk about reparations or Black Lives Matter. The other side won't go forward until you answer questions about underlying issues that they see in both of those things. So then it just kind of goes nowhere. Uh, he says that on the sixth day, critical social justice would say that white people created white fragility. White fragility is triggered by discomfort and is used to control others in their privilege and their whiteness. White fragility is a denial of guilt that is often seen as a proof of guilt. So as soon as you deny you're guilty, it's actually proof that you are guilty. White fragility is seen when white people don't understand, acknowledge, repent of, or work to undo racism. So if you don't do any of those things, you are experiencing white fragility. Out of all of these tenets, this is the new kind of original sin. So if there was an original sin in this quote-unquote religion that Bauckham says is CTR, uh, it would be the sin of, of racism. That would be the new original sin. When we speak of the new original sin, Bauckham says, it's important to note that the old definitions found within the dictionary currently are not the definitions that critical social justice uses. Uh, critical social justice defines racism as a system or advantage based on race involving cultural messaging and the misuse of power. Uh, I don't have it as a, let me see here. He says this is an important shift because now we aren't dealing with the heart of men, but rather institutions. So uh, he says in this chapter as well, around this point, I don't think I have a, a, a bullet point of it, but he says that people are actively working to change these definitions in the dictionary, which then 
uh, redefines the cultural uh, usage of these words, which then, with, then changes everything else. Um, and this is his last point here in this chapter, which he, he kind of pushes home on him, where he says that it's important to see within this new religion of critical social justice, as he calls it, um, you're not dealing with the hearts of individuals. You're actually dealing with institutions. So anybody under this institution is now guilty and you're not calling a person to repent. You're calling an institution of people to repent, um, which is one of his contentions with it because biblically that's not how things work. According to critical social justice, the Bible doesn't make sense outside of social science. At the heart of uh, critical social justice, the sin of racism isn't an individual sin. Rather, uh, sin of racism is now passed down through ethnicity and whiteness. Um, one of the, I'm sorry, here, one who is supporting of racist policies through their actions or inactions or expressing or expressing a racist idea. That is um, a quote from Ibram X. Kendi. The definition of racism explains this. That's his Ibram X. Kendi's definition of racism. I'm sorry, I could have worded that way better. Uh, this definition of racism explains why anti-racists are not moved by individual data. So he points back to chapter three and say that there will be some people that look at the data of the individual cases and won't care. Like they'll acknowledge that the data itself doesn't show systematic racism, Bauckham says. But he says that within the worldview of critical social justice, individual data doesn't matter because you're not looking at individuals. You're looking for systems. Um so he kind of says that, like, I'm providing this data, but for some people it won't matter. That's basically what he says here near the end of chapter four. Uh, this isn't just a thought outside the church. He says in 2018 at the Together for the Gospel con uh, conference, David Platt used the same language in his sermon um, to the conference as far as same language as far as what racism looks like and what racism is. Uh, this means that if one is not seeking equality for all people at all times, they are by definition racist. Uh, and he, again, this is where he says that he doesn't, like, he loves David, he knows David, um, he just doesn't, like, he even points out that apparently this sermon, I can't, I don't know which one it is, I'm sure he names it in the book and I didn't write it down, but um, that exegetically it was a horribly done sermon. So he moves on to chapter five. Um, here he mentions the term ethnic Gnosticism. Uh, he preached a sermon uh, similar uh, to the this title, or maybe the sermon was that title. The idea is that one is a part of a particular ethnicity, holds certain truths that others do not have. This meaning, uh, this meaning that those in minorities know secrets about life that white people don't have access to because of their whiteness, and they have to be taught that. Um, it assumes that there is a black perspective, like a black alone perspective. Bauckham states that critical social justice only cares about the black perspective if it lines up with the tenets stated uh, above. If another black perspective disagrees with the overall black perspective of critical social justice, it is incorrect and deemed internally, it, it's deemed as internal racism, which he points that he's been accused of that a number of times. Uh, it assumes that white people can only gain access to this perspective by elevating black voices. He references a quote from Eric Mason and Phil Vischer uh, referring, uh, referencing that if one wants to understand the black perspective, they must listen to black voices. Um, the narrative or one's truth is ultimately a better truth is what he says in this, in this whole perspective of critical social justice. Baca mentions that if, um, mentions that this is using stories as an alternative truth to rewrite, rewrite what historically happened to a person or a group, etc. Uh, an example is posting accounts of incidents that are later, uh, later proven to be incorrect. To expound on that, he talks about how uh, he gives examples, I think, two, three, or four, uh, where people have posted stuff on social media and said, hey, this, you know, this person was being very racist toward me. They were discriminating against me. And then he says, when the evidence comes out by body cam footage or witnesses, uh, it's shown to be false. So he says that that's the, the idea that one's, one's own account of the story is the ultimate account of the story. Um, there aren't any others that can speak into that. So hopefully that clears three up because three is a little murky if you don't understand what he means by one's truth. Um, the new religion, uh, because it is a new religion, I'm sorry, we did skip over chapter five pretty quick. Just so you know, that's basically the whole chapter. It's talking about how only um, the black perspective matters and nothing else can feed into that. That's basically um, chapter five.
Chapter six, he says that a new religion, which he would classify as critical social justice, needs a new canon. Their canon are the books that promote anti-racism. So, for example, uh, the last book we read, uh, which is uh, by Jamar Tisby, would be considered part of that canon, For ex- just so we kind of get a clear idea of what he's saying here. Uh, those that promote this new canon usually will say that if you haven't read those bur- books, you don't understand. And if when you do read those books, you will see that racism and anti-racism through a new lens. Basically, the idea is, um, again, he's comparing this right next to Christianity, which some Christian would say, hey, you haven't read the Bible, so you don't understand Christianity. Um, the new religion of critical social justice would say, if you haven't read Eber Max Kennedy's book, if you haven't read Right Fragility, if you haven't read a number of other books, then you don't understand. If you haven't wo- read Woke Church, you don't understand. Um, that's kind of the idea of what he's trying to put forth as the new canon. It's all of these different books about anti-racism and about white fragility. Um, he makes it clear that he wants people to be well informed and he thinks that Christians should read all kinds of books and expand their knowledge on how other people think. So he's saying you should read them, read all of them. But he, he says that you should read them within the perspective of Scripture and what Scripture says. Uh, he says that his point is that uh, Scripture is sufficient in teaching us how to live a life with one another between ethnicities. Uh, rather, he says that critical social justice believes that critical science helps us translate and understand Scripture better. Um, he said that before briefly in, I think it was chapter 4, uh, where critical social justice holds to the fact that um, you can only see so much through Scripture. You actually need these other voices to to clarify some things so that you can read scripture more clearly now. Bachman's point is that scripture is sufficient. It doesn't need other voices into it. And we should rely on scripture and not these other canons that can be helpful, but they're not going to help us read scripture any clearer. Um, he he kind of walks that, um, that rope there. The Bible doesn't depend on, uh, on the testimony of any other, uh, any, I'm sorry. The Bible doesn't depend. I could have, I'm sorry, I wrote this horribly. It doesn't depend on other people's voices uh, or on a church's perspective. It relies on God. The Bible neither needs to find authority, uh, neither needs or does it find authority outside of itself. So the Bible is sufficient in and of itself is what he says. Uh, Critical social justice attempts to use eisegesis to read the idea of anti-racism onto scripture to make it say things that it doesn't say. Bakum again states that uh, reading the books from the critical race theory reading list isn't wrong. He acknowledges that one can learn a lot of helpful things from these books. Rather, he says, it is the implications of applying these writings onto scripture and then applying them uh, that we can learn things about ethnicity from outside of what scripture provides. He's saying that uh, he really makes this point (laughs) that he's not discouraging people from reading these other books, but rather he says that if you read these, if you read scripture through these books, that's the problem he has. If you're reading them and saying, I want to know, I want to read this for informational purposes to see what you're thinking and how you process things. He says, that's great because you're also supposed to be reading scripture to do the same thing. But he says, it's when you read scripture through anti-racism, that it's a problem because now you're you're eisegeting things under the text that aren't there. You're reading things on top of the text that aren't there. Uh, the three things, um, he says three things that, that should give us pause. The first is that the Bible is the word of God. So that's what we should be thinking about right off the bat. We don't need anything else other than the Bible. Uh, the Bible is profitable for teaching, he says. He says the Bible is sufficient. When one holds that to the canon of the critical social justice and not to the canon of the scripture, it becomes an issue of reforming the system, not the repentance of one's heart. So what he's saying is he goes back again to this individuality versus system mentality. And he says critical social justice wants to uh, save the systems, reform the systems, whereas scripture says it's not a system issue. It's a heart issue that then develops into a system issue. Um, basically you can't fix the system unless you fix the heart and critical social justice is going after the wrong thing. This is shown uh, by how divisive uh, one's or how diverse one's church is. If one's church isn't diverse, then there's an issue with the church is how critical social justice would see it. He then moves on to chapter seven. Uh, He states that we are currently living on a fault line that he's discussed throughout the entirety of the book. Evangelism or evangelism, evangelism, is currently sitting on that fault line. 
He says uh, his hope with the book is to help Christians uh, find safe ground for when it does split. When the fault lines are present, he states that we all have a we have lost the ability to debate um, and we go right for personal attacks. I found this a little odd. I mean, because, again, I want to be consistent in all these book reviews. He says we shouldn't personally attack people. But at the very beginning, he names names on either side. He's not personally attacking them, but it's it's a it's a very it's a hard line to walk. And I, I get how um, he would say that he's going to get a lot of flack for this book, which I think he kind of did stating that um people can't debate anymore because now it's you know calling each other names from one side or to the other he states the documents like the dallas statement are meant to clarify uh to be clarifying documents to communicate in in clearer ways one's position on matters like this at the end of this book he actually has a copy of the dallas statement so you can read that and understand uh what that that statement says um they are not meant to be as held meant to be as held they are meant. Oh, see, I put they are meant to be as held as high as scripture. It's supposed to say they are not meant to be as held as high as scripture. Uh, Bauckham says that those uh, he would classify as holding to critical race theory or s critical social justice all state they don't actually hold to that belief. But his point is that their actions actually speak to that they do. Um, he's saying that you can say you don't. You can say you're not Marxist. You can say you're not. Uh, a proponent of critical race theory, but how you speak about things and the definitions that you use show you to be on one side or the other. He calls for an open and healthy debate in regards to these issues and states again that uh, in both love and respect that he feels for the people that are currently teaching critical race theory or holding to critical social justice. So I did put that note there. I'm good because I want to make sure that I pointed that out. Uh, he hopes that uh, these conversations and debates before the coming catastrophe. So he is calling... And I don't know, again, at the time that this uh, overview of the book is being made, uh, Vody's having a lot of heart problems. He's been in the hospital forever. Hopefully, when he, if he comes through this, and we hope he does, that um, these debates can happen. Because I think it would be very helpful for, uh, like, Jamar Tisby and Vody Bakum to debate, or Vody to maybe debate um, Jamar, uh, or Eric Mason, for example. I think these would be helpful debates um, to to show that I don't think the polarization is quite as bad as being portrayed in the book. Uh, I think there's a lot more commonality than, than we see, but it would be helpful to have those debates in order to, to flesh that out a bit. Uh, he states that he doesn't think that uh, it is. A, he states that he doesn't think it is an, if the church splits, but a, when the church splits, problem with the fall line he gives an example of revolution resolution 9 at the 2019 southern baptist convention and he works through the statement changes made to Revol resolution 9 he states that the reason he covers this issue within the southern baptist convention is because it's an example of a large issue within all of evangelicalism um chapter the end of chapter 9 where he talks about resolution 9 if you don't know anything about the southern baptist convention and you're not connected to it it's sort of odd to go through because it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, it is a good example. I just don't think a lot of people know about it enough to see it as a great example. Another example might have been more helpful, but he does say it's the most prominent example of critical race theory currently in the church. Uh, in chapter eight, he says there are four issues that he wants to address in the chapter in regards to the damage that critical race theory actually causes. So he shows that what happens, what's been happening, how, how um, critical race theory is its own religion, uh, how it has its own canon, how it has its own theologians and what that looks like and what that means. He talks about where it's been adopted and how it's being adopted in the church. And now he moves into chapter eight and says, this is what it looks like when it is adopted into the church. Uh, he says critical or circular questioning, uh, begging logic occurs and it happens. Systematic racism is the cause of disparities, he says, is there is there accusation and question begging logic. He says, if you doubt that it is that it is because you are also a racist and you want to keep those disparities going. Uh, this has been true. This has to be true, he says, because if you're not a racist, you would know that you had caused the disparities of racism. Basically, he's just giving an example of what circular question begging logic looks like and that circular question begging logic is actually effect uh, and a damage that CTR brings. Um, he says repudiating the research is also a damaging effect of critical race theory. He says um, this isn't a denial that racism exists. He acknowledges that. 
Uh, it is, however, an acknowledgement that research data shows that there are factors that play into a person's choices that lead to a certain outcome um, that have nothing to do with race whatsoever, which is why he provides chapter three. He also, though, acknowledges in chapter four that there will be people that completely ignore the statistics in chapter three because um, it's not an individual thing. It's a systematic thing. So he's kind of uh, he lays that out. Uh, he says that the black pulpit in general has been seen as maybe big proponents of prosperity gospel or critical race theory. But he says in general, black pastors don't necessarily fall into or hold to critical race theory. He says that many teach uh, about biblical fatherhood and marriage, education, crime and abortion. And then that last one on abortion, he's actually going to move into chapter nine here as showing how evangelicalism has actually been infiltrated by critical race theory, but more importantly, critical social justice. He's going to use abortion as an example to show just how deep critical social justice has redefined terms and infiltrated the church. So chapter nine is actually, I think, a much better example than what he used uh, in his example of the Southern Baptist Convention. It's just kind of a different way I think he uses to approach the damage that it causes um, because the SBC is an example of it coming into the church, but he doesn't have any, uh, it's, it's only been two years since that was adopted. So there's no workable examples, especially with COVID when this book was written to show the damage and effects of it. So he, he talks about abortion as a wider, broader thing that's happened within evangelicalism. Bauckham then points toward the aftershocks of acceptance of critical race theory and critical social justice. The first aftershock uh, is the acceptance of many of the other points of critical social justice movement. Um, the third aftershock is there's new priests in the religion of critical race theory. And the fourth aftershock is the uh, enlightened saviors that uh, he, he talks about Tisby. He talks about Kendi. Um, those people coming in and having to explain as an example, he demonstrates to the issue of abortion, just how much critical social justice has come into the church and assisted in the changing of views on abortion. Abortion is now a social justice issue and is considered and you're considered an oppressor. If you stand against abortion, uh, he says, especially within um, black churches, he says he's seen a, a drastic shift in the views on abortion. He points to, sorry, he then points to the start of other topics starting to gain ground as well within Christianity and evangelicalism, uh, specifically gender and sexuality. Um, chapter 10, he states that he doesn't believe that the church has a race problem or that racism is tied into the fabric of America, much like critical social justice would attest to. He then shows how often there are people that make statements that may appear as if America is a systematically racist nation and then he goes on to show that their statements are factually incorrect. He brings a lot of data in. Um, again, you're gonna, you'd have to have that physical copy to sit through and go through all of those, um, those resources. He states that there will be pressure for Christians to succumb to organizations and groups um, that would pressure the church to accept critical social justice and that, that line of thinking. Uh, he states that in this chapter, he will outline how to stand against organizations that do do this. So, um, though it, it's obviously uh, started, he says, his assessment is that it started to come into the Southern Baptist Convention. He gives an example in chapter nine of abortion and how that's kind of infiltrated the church and changed a lot of definitions and thinking and made it not a personal thing, but a social, uh, a social justice issue. And then he moves into chapter 10 and he's going to talk about how uh, when you experience critical social just or uh, critical social justice coming into your organization or to your church, the things that you can do to fight it off. He states that just as the definitions of white supremacy and racism have changed, the definitions for words that are directly connected to Christianity uh, are changing as well. And eventually Christianity could be put under the uh, banner of critical social justice as oppressive and therefore making it harmful and bad. Uh, some of these words and their new definitions are as follows. Uh, he says that religious freedom uh, is used by some as code for white Christians doing what they want to do. Uh, he says that when Christianity is seen as the oppressor and the culture is seen as the oppressed, uh, then there's obviously going to be conflict uh, as well. He states that uh, the opportunity to point out that he is not at war with people he's named in the book. So he does do this a number of times. This is the second time he does it. He's not at war with uh, Matt Chandler, David Platt, Russell Moore. These are the people that he names. Rather, he's at war with the ideology that they uh, have 
in one way or another identified with and used to preach with. He sees critical race theory and critical social justice and Marxism as the cosmic powers that he is at war against. At war against. Uh, he references Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Uh, with the same verse in mind, he says that he will fight these ideologies with Scripture just as we fight racism and other scriptures with, uh, or other sins with Scriptures as well. Again, pointing back to you don't need something else read on top. He's referring to Scriptures enough. Uh, this includes ensuring that there are laws in place to prevent sin where possible. He points toward laws that have already been put in motion to break down the previous uh, broken systematic oppression. Uh, and I think that's important to note. Bakum acknowledges both racism and the reality that systematic oppression has happened. Uh, his argument does not seem to be that neither of those things are real or have happened. He acknowledges both of them. Uh, his contention that he says the fault line is on that critical social justice and specifically underneath that umbrella critical race theory is saying that these things are still happening. And he says that the data is simply not there to prove that. And again, you'd have to get the book to go through that data. A lot of it found in chapter three. Um, he starts working through scripture to show how scripture is enough and how it does not need to be uh, any additional worldview to add to it. Uh, in this in this chapter, in chapter 10, because this is one of the, I think it's the second to last chapter, uh, he, he kind of gives us, though he hasn't given really a working way to, no, there's not been any active tools up to this point, rather, to say, okay, these are the tools you need to fight against critical social justice. Uh, up till this point, it's been, hey, that's the fall line. Hey, something's going to happen. You got to pick a side. This is what it is. This is what happens when you accept it. And now he kind of moves on to, and I, I, he doesn't really expand on this a lot. These, this is kind of the only place in the entire book that he gives kind of tools in order to address this. He starts off that we should understand that we fight with the unified, uh, with the unity of the body as far as Christians. He states that uh, his scriptural reference for this is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Uh, he says we should understand that we as Christians are one body brought together by Christ and all the other walls have been broken down between us. There's no race, race and ethnicity, um, classes, classism, gender, like we're all on equal footing before God. And we should fight against critical social justice with that knowledge that we have in scripture, from scripture. Uh, he also says that we use the weapons we've been given. He references uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, as well as Ephesians chapter 6, verses uh, 13 through 17, uh, the armor of God, essentially, is what he's referencing. Uh, he says, we do not need to add anything to scripture. We've been given everything we need. So he says, if you're confronted with racism or systematic, ra uh, or systematic racism, you would fight that with scripture. Um, just as you fight critical uh, social justice with scripture because it is opposed. And that's what he's, he's um, worked through and uh, in an attempt to prove up to this point that, that you're also fighting against that. Um, he says you destroy arguments and speculations, uh, referring to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. And then he moves uh, to spend a good amount of time speaking uh, to what has caused much tension in the church in the last year. And he spends a good amount of time talking about Black Lives Matter, uh, the organization, and why he will not align with it and how it is diametrically opposed to uh, Christianity um, and the, system, uh, the, the family structure and everything the Bible says about that. Um, he spends a good time on that in chapter 10. Uh, and then he says that we take every thought captive as believers, refer uh, referring to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. And these right here, he says, uh, these are the things that we use to fight against everything that's been talked about in this book. So racism, critical social justice, critical race theory, um, uh, intersectionality, like all of that. We, we, when that comes to us, we say, okay, this is what scripture says. This is how scripture says to deal with this. And that's what we use to do that. He says, we don't add anything on top of that. We don't need to add anything on top of that. And that's why he sees uh, up to this point, this is in chapter 10, he states that this is why he sees critical race theory and critical social justice as a problem because he sees it as a worldview and not a tool. And if it's a worldview, you're, you're reading scripture through that worldview. And he says that is unnecessary and that's actually harmful. And that's why he says that you use scripture and these specific things here to fight against those other things. Uh, he says, we listen with discernment. We take all Fox captives and we preach the truth in love. Uh, Bakken puts into perspective the reality of the slave trade, racism, uh, how much slavery has robbed him of his 
history. Uh, the injustice is done through people throughout time. He tells the story of visiting Africa for the first time and preaching and actually breaking down um, when he realizes all of that. And this, again, I think this is incredibly important because I didn't expect him to go into that when I picked up this book. Um, but this is a very personal book of where he's showing that he's uh, how he's kind of processed all of this himself as well um, uh, through scripture. He says that he forgave all of the above, which is the, the history stolen from him, the slave trade, the racism, um, because he was overcome with the majest majesty and the weight of God's providence in his life. Um, that his ancestors had survived the slave trade, that he was born in America, that all the events that led him up um, to this point to where he wasn't a slave to men, but a slave to Christ. He says he recognizes uh, that because of God's providence, he was blessed beyond his wildest dreams. Uh, at this point, there could be people that take contention with this because he basically says that, uh, maybe not here, maybe it was earlier in the book, but basically he says that um, it was the providence of God that his ancestors were sold to slavery to America and not to uh, Islamic countries because he says uh, historically a lot of the slaves that were sold from Africa to Islamic countries um, didn't even make it there in the first place. And when they did, they didn't live long. So he actually sees it as a blessing that his ancestors were sold to uh, into American slavery, uh, even though all the horrific stuff that comes with that, he says, but he says that in God's providence, it led him to this point. And people have taken contention with that as far as I understand. But anyway, that's just to, to have clarity there. Uh, he says that um, the way forward is forgiveness toward one another. He says that the world declares uh, that there can be no reconciliation without justice. But he says that we need to recognize the problem. I'm sorry. He says that they recognize the problem, that there needs to be, uh, there can't be reconciliation without justice. They recognize that problem, but... They don't see the solution. The solution in this case is Christ. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 31 and 32. He says adding anything on top of that uh, is adding to the gospel. So he says that Christ is that reconciliation. Uh, he is the one that brought justice to us all um, by um, saving us from our sins. He wants to be, I'm sorry, he wants this to be a call to unmask critical social justice and have uh, people that are preaching it have their blinders removed and then they, they can contend once for the faith delivered to all the saints, uh, as they did before. He references Jude chapter 3. Uh, the goal is to expose, which is Ephesians chapter 5 verse 11, to warn people, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15, and to correct people, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 25, in hopes that they will come to their senses and escape the snares of the devil after being captured by him to do his will, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 26. Uh, he calls these I, these ideas demonic and evil. He's very clear about that throughout the book, that uh, he thinks that critical social justice and critical race theory specifically are evil and demonic. Um, moments like this are scattered throughout church history, he says, moments in which brothers and sisters uh, contend for issues of the gospel. Bachman contends that this is one of those moments in history, and like Spurgeon's downgrade controversy and the modernist controversy with the fundamentalist, this is very similar to those situations. Um, if you don't know about those, I actually did uh, another video. It was a sermon review. The sermon review you can watch or not watch, but the, the first 15 minutes of that sermon review talk about both of these things, it's just, which is why I mention it. I'll include that in the links down below as well. Um, so overall thoughts. Um, obviously this is an overview of the book, not a review, but the overall thoughts is that Bauckham, you, you would have to know, uh, about critical race theory and critical social justice before you picked up this book. I think he does a really good job of, of defining those terms. I didn't see any terms that he used incorrectly. Um, all of the terms that he used and he defined that he said critical race theory would define them this way are all terms that uh, White Fragility used and, uh, or I'm sorry, that uh, D'Angelo used and Tisby used in their books. Um, so those seem to line up good. Uh, I think this book could, and we'll talk about this a lot in the, the very last video when we all, when it all comes together, but I think this book, Bachum could have done a much better job of um, covering tools to interact with critical social justice and fight against it and push back against it. Um, in a much more kind of fleshed out terms than he did. I, I appreciate that he does cover them and give scriptural stances for them. I just feel like that was sort of a blip 
in a much bigger picture. But again, he states that that's, that wasn't his point. His point was to simply say, here's the problem. This is what it looks like when you adopt it. And this is what happens when you do adopt it. So pick a side. Um, that was the purpose of the book. Maybe he'll come out with another book or a revived version of this book where he kind of adds those tools in a little bit because I think that would have been more helpful. Uh, I think that's what a lot of people were expecting from this book, honestly, was that there would be some sort of tools or actionable items. Uh, it would be him pointing while holding the sword, not just him pointing, right? Um, that was kind of, I think, the expectation. That was at least my expectation. So uh, that's the overall overview of the book. Um, the next book we'll cover, uh, if it's already done, it'll be in the description below. If not, um, it will be When Socialism Goes to Church by jo um, Josh, John. It'll be by Harris. Harris is his last name. Um, and then after that one, we'll go into a uh, fifth video about how do we process all this together. So uh, if you found this helpful, go ahead and share it. Go ahead and like it. Go ahead and comment below if you felt like I didn't uh, portray one of his chapters well or I, don't, I didn't use... Um, there was some sort of inconsistency that you saw in the book that maybe I, maybe I saw different or you felt like I portrayed incorrectly. Or if you liked the book, let me know what you liked about it in the comments below. Because um, even reading or listening through three times, um, I'm sure I missed something. So, guys, thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. I'll talk to you later.